Please join me in the Christian greeting. <coughs> the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. And also with you. Please stand for the call to worship. <coughs> Listen, <coughs> the Lord calls out to us, offering life. Walk in the paths of God's commandments with delight. With our whole heart, we will turn to you and live. Our hymn of praise is a mighty fortress.
We have turned away from you, following lesser ways, pursuing a lesser life than the life ordered to us in Christ. Yet you will not abandon us. You call out, warning and wooing us to turn, to return to you, even when we fall away from brothers and sisters in the church, you remain present for us. Help us to love as you love, wholeheartedly, until we are reconciled to you and to our neighbors. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Our sins weigh us down, and we struggle to live in freedom and joy. When we turn and return to God who loves us, God finds pleasure. We turn now confessing our sins against God and neighbor. For evil, even when it masquerades as good, merciful God, deliver us from selfishness and vain desires. Merciful God, deliver us from Let us conclude our prayer of confession together. Merciful God, deliver us. Turn us away from the death, sin, and place. Lead us into the abundant life Christ brings. Forgive us, we pray, and teach us to forgive through Jesus Christ. Amen. Laying aside the works of darkness, we live in the light of Christ. In Jesus Christ, we are forgiven and lifted up to new life. Time. The hour has already 
because our salvation is near and in the most close to me. The night is nearly over, the day is almost here. So let's put aside the needs of our and put on the arm of our life. Let us be hasty to sing and to pray. Not our salvation in darkness, not in sexual immorality and mockery, not in sexual injustice. Rather, clothe yourselves with the Lord Jesus Christ. Do not be the Catholic and the Catholic and Our gospel reading is from Matthew, chapter 18, verses 15 through 20. Hear the word of the Lord. If your brother or sister sin, go and point out their fault, just between the two of you. If they listen to you, you have won them over. But if they will not listen, Take one or two others along, so that every matter may be established by the testimony of two or three witnesses. If they still refuse to listen, tell it to the church. And if they refuse to listen even to the church, treat them as you would a pagan or a tax collector. Truly, I tell you, whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. And whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Again, truly, I tell you that if two of you on earth agree about anything they ask for, it will be done for them by my Father in heaven. For where two or three gather in my name, there am I with them. Is this the word of the Lord? Okay, come on up for the children's message. Just do today, since Riley is not here.
lived in New Jersey, that was one of my favorite places to go. And uh, it was just very, very interesting to go into the Amish country and still realize that they're using horses and buggies and they don't have electricity or phones. It's, it's kind of hard to picture it, but they draw a lot of people who seem to be very fascinated by it. In an overly technological dependent world, the lives of the Amish seem more different with each passing year. This is perhaps part of their appeal. How can they go their entire lives without utilizing the devices that the majority of the world cannot live without? Isn't their very disconnectedness that attracts the curious and prompts the question, could we live like that? Curiosity about the Amish have spawned an entire industry, not just in places like Lancaster, but in larger population culture as well. They don't have television, but there are television shows like Breaking Amish and the Amish Mafia. Attempts to capitalize on fascination with these unusual people, adding a bit of sensationalism to what otherwise might be mundane stories of farming and raising families. One aspect of Amish culture that is often viewed with disdain by the wider, wider society looking in as the practice of shunning. Beverly Lewis, who has carved her niche by writing romance in that novel set in Amish communities, even titled one of her books, The Shunning. Shunning means turning away from someone because of their violations of church discipline. If someone leaves the Amish church or persists in breaking the church's rules, <coughs> they risk being shunned, meaning that the community, perhaps even their family, will avoid contact with them. Many people, just seeing the surface, find this practice very cruel. Those who practice shun shunning, however, point to the passage we heard today from Matthew's Gospel as a biblical basis for this extreme exercise of church discipline. While society might consider shunning a judgmental practice after all. Paul says that we all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. It is important to remember that the key is not to get rid, the key is not just to rid the community of a sinner per se, but to get rid of the sin, not the sinner, but the sin. The hope is that separation from the community will lead the shunned person to repentance. Shunning is really the absolute last resort. The very first step in the process that Jesus outlines is this. The one who has sinned against you should go to the one who has sinned and point out the fault when the two of you are alone. This might work. Jesus says, if the member listens to you, you have gained that one. Regaining the offender is the primary mission. If other people, if the other person does not listen, however, and refuses to be reconciled, then two or more others should be brought in to witness the discussion between the first two parties. This reflects a provision in Deuteronomy that says, a single witness shall not suffice to convict a person of any offense or wrongdoing in connection with any offense that may be committed. Only on the evidence of two or three witnesses should a charge be sustained. Jesus seems to put a bit of stock in the evidence of two or three witnesses. If they agree on anything at all, it will be done by my Father in heaven. Just prior to this amazing statement, Jesus says that whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. 
and whatever you loose on earth will be loosened in heaven. These assertions need to be viewed in the context in which Jesus made them. We are talking about church discipline. In fact, the word Jesus uses in the passage is ecclesia, which is the Greek word for assembly, which in English means church. This passage is primarily concerned with the statute of church members. It does not seem to promise that two or three people agreeing on anything at all will get exactly what they ask for. We have tremendous promises in scripture, scripture about reading, receiving answers to our prayers. John's Gospel records Jesus saying, I will do whatever you ask in my name so that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If in my name you ask for anything, I will do it. This is an astounding statement about God's desire to provide what we need. But these verses from Matthew, though they still put a great deal of authority into human hands, do not seem to indicate that God will do whatever we agreed God should do, caught blank. The Amish are not the only ones who practice some form of shunning in the Roman Catholic Church. The term excommunication is given for the state of being denied access to the sacraments for a greatest offense of church discipline. Many Baptist church bylaws include a process to discipline members in a similar manner to the process Jesus lays out in Matthew. The Book of Discipline of the United Methodist Church and the Book of Order in the Presbyterian Church outline a process for bringing both clergy and lay members to trial for ch chargeable offenses. Our, our Presbytery has a um, group of people, pastors and lay people, who listen. They're the um, committee for discipline. And there have been cases where clergymen have been stripped of their ordination. So the Presbyterian Church takes very seriously, and it's been known to have a person who's an elder in the Presbyterian Church lose being an elder who breaking some of the main laws of the church. So we take discipline very seriously. In each case, the intent is to bring about repentance and reconciliation. Treating someone as a Gentile or tax collector is not meant to be mean-spirited. You can still love someone and assist them when they are in need, even if you, for a time, push back from the relationship. This is where the teaching of Jesus in this passage personal. Let us face it. There is a problem today in dealing with personal conflicts. Social media platforms like Facebook and Twitter have made it too easy to snipe at each other when we are in disagreement. These sites can be very handy, a very handy way to keep in touch with people. As a pastor, I have found them helpful. We can see people's posts about what is going on in their lives, since we often feel, as a pastor, sometimes we're the last to know something. One negative aspect of social media, however, is the broad platform that it gives people to air their grievances. It is quite gut-wrenching to log on to Facebook and read a long post that someone has written detailing all the problems that they have with their spouse how their spouse has wronged them, and about how they thought someone was their friend only to be betrayed. Of course, they are well rewarded for their efforts. The posts come up with a number of likes and comments from sympathetic friends about how just plain awful the other person is and how they never like them away. I know we all tell our teenagers and our children Watch what you say on these medias. Don't say anything 
that could hurt anybody or any of your own personal business. I know my granddaughter shared a lot of things. This was years ago. And it all came back and bit her. She learned the hard way not to put anything on Facebook that's personal. There are many multiple problems with the approaches for Facebook and Twitter and these other things. Privacy is a major concern, of course. Now the family's personal business is out there for all the world to see. That business has been filtered through one lens. The one who feels wrong can describe the situation however he or she wants. The use of social media to get back at another person is simply unbiblical. Jesus' conflict resolution system feels downright revolutionary in a world that seems to encourage confrontation over texts and tweets. Jesus' teaching is that we should go to the one who wronged us and attempt a resolution before going or doing anything else. I've been involved with a great deal of conflict resolution, first as a teacher and then as a pastor. In fact, uh, right when the pandemic came, I was supposed to do a workshop on conflict resolution at a big conference in Texas. Well, that got canceled. But I do have quite a background in it. And you know what? It works, talking it out. I say 90% of the time, we use it a great deal in teaching. The passage we read for today is reminiscent of Jesus' statement in the Sermon on the Mount that says, when you are offering your gift at the altar, if you remember that your brother or sister has something against you, leave your gift there before the altar and go. First, be reconciled to your brother or sister, and then come and offer your gift. How can we re expect to reconcile with God when we haven't been reconciled with one another first? The first step towards this reconciliation is that face-to-face, one-on-one account. Jesus does not say to send a tweet or make a Facebook post. He says, go. Only after this first attempt fails are we involved, do we involve anyone else. Even then, it would not be through a computer. We should go again, this time with two or three others, and try to bring about a healing resolution. If that fails, there is one more escalation involving the church. At this point might mean asking a pastor or other leader to serve as a mediator or even seeking mediation through counseling or other professionals. It would only be after all these attempts fail that we would move on to an understanding that the relation perhaps needs to be broken for a time in order to heal. And if not, to not infect the church. Taken as a whole, and not just focus it on that last resort step, the process Jesus outlines for discipline and conflict resolution is gracious. It acknowledges the dignity of the other person, as well as their value as a friend and as a member of the community. Particularly in today's culture, taking the time to sit down with someone and work to salvage a relationship feels a bit like the reign of God has come near. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Our hymn of response is joyful, joyful, we endure. Let us stand.
we believe by saying the Apostles' Creed found in your bulletin. I believe in God the Father Almighty, Father of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his Son, our Lord, who is conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and stood up on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and in the life of everlasting. Let us pray. God of grace, steadfast love, we thank you for your commandments, which order our lives together. We thank you for calling us to live honorably with one another and pray for your grace as we try to do all that you require. Increase in us, we pray the capacity to love you and our neighbors without reserve, and to love even those who harm us, not wholeheartedly, but with whole hearts. We bring before you the cares, the concerns, and the joys that occupy us. We remember before you that those who are at odds with one another in families, in neighborhoods, or offices, or even in church. We pray for nation and nations in the midst of internal or external struggles and conflicts. Teach us, O oh God, to seek nonviolent ways toward resolution. Help us to speak the truth and to listen with understanding when perspectives are far apart. We pray for love to bring peace into every troubled heart and place. Remember before those who have physical needs today, people who are hungry and thirsty, people who are exhausted by the demands of work or caregiving. We pray for those who are sick, particularly Cindy, Gail, and Maddie, all those who are undergoing surgery, and people who live with chronic pain. Bring relief and rest, we pray. We particularly pray for all those on our prayer list. We remember those weighted down with needs of heart and soul, a worry that keeps us awake at night, grief that accompanies us everywhere we go, depression that clouds us or an addiction that grips us. Lift all of these heavy burdens with the light and peace of your presence. We pray. Sustain us over the long journey towards health and give us trust in you, ourselves, and those who love us. We remember before you not only our cares, but also our joys, a birthday celebrated, an anniversary enjoyed, new beginnings, a baby born, a new school year begun, and a new job, a new relationship. We thank you, O oh God, for the gift of laughter, for enduring friendships, and for cherished memories. We give thanks that with you, there is always a new beginning, a way where there is no way, hope beyond hope, and life beyond death. We pray for Jesus Christ, our risen Lord, who taught us by pray, to pray by saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And it is temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen.
to the church in Rome was this. Oh, no one anything except to love one another. So come, let us love one another and all in God's world by sharing what we have been giving so that needs are met and the gospel is proclaimed. <laughs> found in your bulletin. Let us pray together. God of our salvation, we know what time it is, time to wake from sleep and to turn from selfishness. We offer now our time, our talents, and our resources to be used for your good purposes and all for love's sake. Through Jesus Christ we pray. Amen. Amen. Our ascending him is, he is here, he is here. It's been a while since we sang this, so I'll play the first verse all the way through. <laughs> understand 
but God's commandments are an invitation to daily faithfulness. Love God and your neighbor every day, and you will fulfill all that God intends. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you now and forevermore. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen.